Okay, my name is Ralph May, and I'm a member of, or president of, I guess, the Friends of the Esther Hazy Flour Mill, which is a committee formed to restore the flour mill and make it into a tourist attraction. The economy in the area in 1907 was farming, and farmers needed products on the farm and flour to, to maintain the lifestyle that they wanted. And the people that lived in the area uh, did a lot of work to get the mill here because before this time, before this was built, uh, they had to walk literally to Whitewood and carry flour back through the valleys. So getting the mill built here was extremely important. And they convinced Mr. Saunders to, to finance the mill here. Now, James Saunders uh, was an entrepreneur and he owned the mill in Whitewood and he had the mill in Esther Hazy built. The mill was built here, uh, in, it started operating in, in June of 1907. He owned it for, I think, about three years until Mr. Size bought it from him. Yes, if you could think back to 1907, this was a very small place. I believe the railway had been here for three or four years. And there would have been literally carloads of timbers and equipment that would have come in here and had to be assembled by a crew of men and we don't know how big a crew it would have been. We haven't been able to find pictures of it actually being assembled, but it would have been quite a quite a sight to behold if you could have seen the the construction of the place. It's a combined flour mill and elevator and it's a very unique structure. Uh, it's I think the only one of its kind in Western Canada or this side of Quebec. And it's all wood construction, wood beams post and tenon construction, slope shoulder, roof on the elevator, which indicates that it's early 1900 vintage. Post and beam construction, you know, you need massive beams for areas where you're going to get heavy weight and flour mills. They would have very heavy equipment as you have all of the milling equipment that uh, had to be supported. Uh, the beam structure ca carried the main frame of the building. So Esther Hazy was a typical example of that. If you want to see a good post on beam uh, facility, uh, Esther Hazy flour mill is probably one of the best in Saskatchewan. These beams spanning the full width of the building are put together with mortise and tenon. So there's a, and a pin to stabilize the beam if there's any shifting or movement of the building. Uh, the biggest timbers in the building are uh, probably one foot by two feet and they go the full width of the building which is probably 40 feet. Uh, the main purpose of the building here when it was first established was to give the farmers a place to take their wheat and get products that they needed on the farm. So a 60 bushel wagon would give you about 2,400 pound bags of flour or some combination of flour, bran, shorts, screenings, uh, pig starter, chick starter, whatever they needed on the farm. I believe at that time there was very little cash in, in the system. So yes, everything that was uh, sent out of here was basically traded for wheat. You brought in wheat and you took home other products that you needed and very little cash changed hands and it was a real bartering and meeting place in, in the town. The heyday of the mill, I suspect, would have been very early in its life when the, the, the local people, there were people came from quite a ways north, south, east, and west of here because the closest mill was Whitewood and then it burnt down in 1909. So there was a lot of traffic through here in early days. Uh, in later, times in the 1930s they actually milled and shipped overseas and there was a lot of flour went out of here during the war. Uh, the elevator section of the building is involves a, a scale room where the material would have been scaled and, and the product would have been determined quality wise. It then was elevated into the elevator and it has eight storage bins in it. Uh, they hold each about 2,500 bushels or roughly a million pounds of grain can be stored in the elevator section of the building if it was full. And the flour mill uh, has storage for grain that was cleaned once, and then it's cleaned three more times, stored again, and they could mill here 600 pounds of flour an hour. 
Uh, the meal here is, it appears to, to the untrained eye to be a fairly large facility, but 600 pounds of flour an hour is not an economical situation in today's market. And so it just got to the point where it wasn't viable to, to purchase grain and do what was required to make it into flour. The building was milling flour until about 1981. It was then owned by a person by the name of Rip Lop, who didn't really mill flour here. Uh, it, he finally left it uh, for taxes. It went back to the town. In 1994-95, it was in very, very bad shape. It was in danger of being demolished. And the committee, the Friends of the Esther Hazy Flour Mill, was formed in 1996 and proceeded to make the exterior weatherproof and secure the windows and so on to keep out unwanted visitors. And we've been working, or the committee has been working, to get the exterior painted, redo walkways, uh, make it into something that we can show to as a tourist facility to give people a view of the history of the, the area. 1998, I believe, the mill was declared a municipal heritage property. A man by the name of Frank Corvermaker with the Saskatchewan Heritage Foundation was a big push towards getting this place declared a, a municipal property. And once it was declared a municipal property, there was access to some funding to do things like uh, painting windows, uh, redoing the roof. All of the outbuildings have cedar shakes and shingles on them. That funding came from the Saskatchewan Heritage Foundation once we were declared a municipal heritage property. Uh, well, there were flour mills. There were many flour mills in the province over the years. Uh, many small communities uh, built flour mills because of the ease of, you know, the community needed ready access to flour. And yet today, to our knowledge, there are only three standing uh, pre-1950, 1940 flour mills in Saskatchewan. Uh, so we don't have a lot to choose from and throw away. Uh, we want preservation of the heritage property for a variety of, of reasons. One is we want to, re, uh, we want to maintain an, a, a continuum of, of our heritage uh, as it has evolved over the centuries. We want to have representations of our heritage. And over here we got a neat little thing. If people want to look at industrial heritage sites, they have a particularly good uh, one at Esterhazy. It's been uh, restored. Uh, it, it, portions of it are in working order, so you can see the mechanism in operation uh, on certain occasions. Uh, it's, it's been cleaned up. It's well looked after. Uh, and there's a community support that backs it all up. So this is a good, viable community project. Yeah, we're all volunteers here. Um, uh, again, uh, as with most of the other guys, uh, I'm retired. I, I used to teach school here in, in Esterhazy. So I've been over here for, for years now, and uh, we gather here about once a week to, uh, to clean up, to get things back into the shape that they should have been in. And uh, I also conduct tours, so if anybody's interested in having a tour, they'd go over to the museum or phone me, and uh, I would come down here and and give them a tour of the, of the establishment. I think it's important, uh, it tells us about the pioneers and, and the struggles and, uh, and the fact that uh, we are a, an agricultural province. It shows how, how things became established. For example, uh, uh, this fl flour mill uh, became established because it was too distant to go to Whitewood, which was the nearest flour mill to here. Uh, in those days, uh, apparently the pioneers would walk to Whitewood from this area and uh, they would carry wheat down in, to the Whitewood direction and carry flour back this way on their backs. So there was a need for, for the establishment of a flour mill here. Uh, the grain would arrive in the scale room where it would be graded and weighed and the farmer would be given credit for the amount of product based on the amount of grain that he brought in. Uh, the wheat would then be elevated into one of the eight storage bins in the elevator it would then later be cleaned and stored in one of the storage bins in the mill. And then it would go through the Hungarian patent milling process to become flour, be bagged, and either returned to the farmers or shipped all across Canada, in fact, all across the world at one time. 
Right, we're, we're in the scale room of the Esther Hazy flour mill. Uh, the wagon is what they call the 60 bushel wagon and it would haul in 60 bushels of wheat. And there's a large door on the west end or behind the wagon that would have been opened. It would allow the horses to pull the wagon up the ramp and they would stop it at this position. If they were calm and used to being handled, they would remain hooked to the wagon while it was being weighed and the back of the wagon would be opened up so that the grain would fall out into the pit through the grates on the floor. The front end of the wagon would be lifted with the hoist to help the grain to be dumped out by shoveling for the farmer or the miller. The pit goes down about 10 feet below me and through the wall to the elevator leg to be lifted into the storage bins. While that was happening, they would have taken, the miller would have taken a sample of grain from different parts of the load, and we're told that he would even refuse the grain if he didn't think it was milling quality. Uh, the sample they would do three things with. They would do a moisture test, and they did that by chewing. And one of the millers said, if your teeth almost break, it's dry. They would do a protein content or milling quality test. They did that by chewing as well. And if you chew wheat, it makes gum. The better the gum, the better the milling quality. Yeah. And they would compare We've it to something, that. a sample that they knew was good, from there. good wheat. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And they would also do a dockage test. So there'd be a machine here to remove uh, weed seeds, bran you know, cracked grain and stuff. And then they would walk out the other door with the empty wagon. Oh, to weigh the wagon would take less than a minute, probably. To dump it might take five minutes, so maximum ten minutes in here to dump and weigh and determine how much product they would have. All right, we're in the office of the uh, flour mill in the back room, the rather substantial safe where he kept the money that he was needed. Uh, when farmers brought uh, grain in after the product was weighed, they would be get a grain ticket and it would indicate how many bushels of grain they brought in and how much dockage there was. And it would be dated in this particular case. This is uh, 1909 when these grain tickets were written up. Once the grain has been weighed and determined how much the farmer has brought in and it's gone into the pit, the elevator leg becomes the next thing that operates these buckets will carry the grain from the pit, which is about 10 feet below us, up to the head, which is about 55 feet above us. <clears throat> this is turning. And at the head, there are Gerber chutes that will allow the grain to be distributed to one of the eight storage bins above us. And each bin will hold about 2,500 bushels. That's a lot of grain. That's a lot of grain. That's right. Yeah, a lot of grain, a lot of weight. And everything in here was either moved with bucket elevators or gravity. You took it up with an elevator and it came down to wherever you needed it and then you carried it back up again. <coughs> okay, just watch your step there. And the bucket elevators move the grain wherever it goes and then gravity gets it back to where we need to work with it. So. to convert wheat into flour and to get it ready for making flour it had to be cleaned and this every kernel of grain that came into the building had to go through this fanning mill or separator and the fanning mill uses a big fan which blows the dust and chaff off the grain the rest of the product will move down over top of screens and sieves to separate weed seeds, cracked grain, that sort of thing out. Once the, the grain in the system has been cleaned, and it's cleaned four times, uh, we get to the problem that we have hard red spring wheat in Saskatchewan, and it's difficult to mill without, well, you can't mill it in just a stone grinder. It makes very fine powder, and you can't separate the bran from the white flour. So there was a system developed that was called the Hungarian Patent Milling System. And it's a rather elaborate process where they add steam and then let the bran or the wheat sit for 24 hours so the bran is softened up and comes out in bigger chunks. All of this process, the cleaning process, was done with a single cylinder engine 
and then they would start up the steam engine when they were going to mill flour. Uh, we're in what we call the wheel room in the Esterhazy flour mill. Uh, the line of pulleys that you can see running to my right is supplying power to the grinders on the milling floor. There's also a pulley here that sends power to the top of the third floor to run all of the bucket elevators and sifters and horizontal loggers that are located on the third floor. Prior to 1947, this section of the main mill would have been powered by a steam engine and they would then mill flour using that. After 1947, there was a diesel, a UD-18 international diesel engine at about 125 horsepower that runs the entire mill. The power is directed to this line of pulleys through a clutch which sends the power either to the elevator or to the milling floor. All right, after the uh, wheat has been tempered, it's sat in the bin for 24 hours. It's then going to come down the chute above us and enter the grinder. And the wheels, drums inside the grinder are moving in opposite directions and they're moving at different speeds. This lever will open and close the distance between the drums. So you adjust it just so that you skin a little bit of the weed off. You don't want to crush it or else it'll shatter it and we don't want to do that. And then this would engage the, the drums once you've started the product running through. So each grinder has a lever to engage it and a distance adjustment between the grinders. Uh, each time that the grain went through the grinder, one set of rollers, it would come up a bucket elevator and go into a sifter. And the sifter is shaking because of an offset weight on the top of it. And the product would make its way through the screens and silk screens, coming out a sock at the bottom, down a chute into another grinder. In on top of the sieves or the screens, there's a little brush here that would keep the screens from plugging up as the product was moving through it. There's two sifters in this on this floor, one's a little bigger on the other side. Then it comes to the back side of the grinder where there's another two wheels up to the sifter, front of this one to the sifter, back to the sifter, four trips to get rid of the bran. Remember 100 pounds of wheat will give you 30 pounds of bran. The bran ends up in a storage bin on the other side of the room and it's bagged over there. The rest of the product goes up and down six more times before it comes flour. Once we have flour produced after passing through all ten sets of grinders and sifter, it would be stored in this bin or another bin over here. This bin was used to bag 25 or 50 pound bags. Weighed on the scale, there would have been a sewing machine here to sew up the bag. This is an automatic 100 pound bagger. The belt is turning, which causes a worm on the inside to turn and feed the flour down into the bag, which would be attached there. This goes down. When it clicks off, you have an automatic 100 pound bag of flour. It too would have been sewed up and then stacked on the floor here to cool off. Uh, they had quality control at this point. They would produce some flour because they had to blend it because they had lots of different qualities of wheat. They actually sent the flour out to a Mrs. Cantor, a Mrs. Cornell, and she would, they would bake the bread, bring it back. The miller would cut it and decide if he had good quality flour or not. As, as far as employment in the building is concerned, earlier on there would have been a steam engine and a boiler. There was probably a steam or boiler person that was working here. There would have been a miller who probably gr bought the grain and determined the quality and one worker or maybe two if they were doing a lot of milling. At other times we were told that the one miller did everything. He bought the grain, he cleaned the grain, he prepared it, he milled it and he bagged it. So he could have, would have been a busy man. <laughs> and they say that the millers came out 
white like you see pictures of people coming out of coal mines black as they would be white with flour and so it wasn't it wasn't a very nice place to work and it would have been hot and it was heavy work you're hauling hundred pound bags of flour around uh, the working conditions in here according to the paper on the wall is occupational health says it's a very good place to work safe uh, there are zero guards on any belts and pulleys there are no handrails on the walkways on the third floor where you would have to oil and service anything up on the third floor uh, it would not pass any occupational health and safety inspection today there would have to be a lot of work done on the, when, when looking at preserving a heritage building you have there has to be some flexibility uh, come in uh, Often the, uh, the standards of safety, for instance, and, and lighting and access are just not acceptable to the present day society and in some cases are illegal. And so we have to find ways to accommodate that in, uh, in how we deal with these buildings. No heritage site is worth you know, a serious injury or the life of somebody. People ask whether we'll have, a, have the whole thing running and with the safety regulations that are in place now, there is no way that you could run it and not have everything guarded up. Uh, you'd lose all the ambience of the place if you start doing that. So, so we've just done little bits and pieces to get running, just to, as a demonstration. Uh, we want to try and be as flexible as possible, but uh, on the other hand, you're also looking at preserving the heritage character of the, of the structure, and by that, the heritage character of the community. Uh, after all, you know, if we get visitors here, whether it's from other parts of the province or our country or out of country, people want, you want to see the real thing. Uh, and now, the real thing in this case is the integrity of the structure is still there. And, and the building fabric is there. When we look at, at uh, reviewing a building for alterations, uh, you know, uh, these designated buildings, we strongly look at, first of all, uh, re restoring and, and repairing the existing fabric. So the community has become an absolutely, uh, not only an integral, but an absolutely essential part in, in most restorations. So while some of the professional expertise might come from uh, architectural firms or professional heritage organizations, at uh, Esther Hazy, uh, the local community sets up, set up fundraising programs and, and they run those. There are often people in the community who are uh, fascinated with machinery and they will take on the task of taking a, an engine apart and rebuilding it or taking the, uh, the wheels uh, apart and rebuilding it. It'll be five years since I retired at the mine and I'm just doing volunteer work. Well, this is my job at the mine. I was a journeyman mechanic, industrial, so it just come natural to me. Okay, so if you want, I don't know what this engine is. It starts on gas and I'll switch it over to diesel. Kind of cantankerous old gal, but it runs. This is their way of reducing their costs. You know, there's, there, it's not cheap to restore an historic uh, structure. All of the uh, grant money that comes from the Saskatchewan Heritage Foundation is on a 50-50 grant. They pay 50%, we put up 25%, and then 25% is towards labor. You get community volunteers who suit up and they get the masks and these terrible suits and they swelter and they take out shovels and bagfuls and bagfuls of pigeon dung and clean up the site. Because that's the way Esterhazy was 15 years ago. It was just covered in pigeon dung. And then I was there last summer, and wow, <laughs> it, is, it was so clean you could eat off the floor. Well, we're just replacing some of these chutes that we had to take off. We had to clean all the bins. The, uh, the pigeons had taken over the, the mill for quite a few years before we came back in, so we had to clean all that out. Oh, the volunteers, they're amazing. Uh, if it wasn't for the volunteers realizing the potential of the flour mill, it wouldn't be standing today. In fact, it was earmarked for demolition in 1995. And, and look, 10 years later, it's a provincial heritage site. They uh, made something now that we can really Ralph. be proud of as a community. Ralph, hi. You got Leo out there? I need a hand here. I got Leo out there? No. He's, uh... Yeah, doing he something went, with the engine over he there. He went to get a battery. What do you need? Give me a push from down there. When it's a community project, uh, when there's a, 
a common goal, a common, or if, if they see that the, the development of this is, is good for the community, good for business as a whole, good for drawing tourists, or good for making us feel proud of our community, boy, do they get behind the project. Uh, in uh, June of 2007 will be the 100th year anniversary of the flour mill producing flour, and we're hoping to celebrate this particular occasion. This is uh, truly one of a kind, and I think uh, for me personally, it's important that uh, it remains standing and, and preserved. It would be, it would be terrible if, if something happened to it. We average around 800 tourists a year that come through the building and we conduct tours through here. Some of them are groups, a lot of school groups in, the, in May and June, and then some tour groups and others just phone calls. And I've got company, I like to come over and see the mill. And there's about four or five of us that do tours on request. And we, we're open 365 days a year, I guess, if you got enough clothes in the wintertime. 24-7. 24-7. Well, it's a little dark at night, but the 365 works. Okay.